Ma'am, shall we start now? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, yes. Good evening and welcome to all. Jai Bhim Sabhi Ko. My name is Manuk Kumar hai and uh, I am the director of Naranda Academy. So welcome to the second lecture of our monthly Nalanda Symposium. Nalanda Symposium, which is a new initiative where we every month uh, we try to bring a distinguished scholar from diverse backgrounds, from the field of law, from sciences, from social sciences, and ask them to, to deliver a lecture on a given theme uh, so that our students can develop, you know, understanding of, of different topics. And, and apart from their own uh, studies, our students should get the exposure of what kind of research work is happening in other fields. So our symposium is our prayas कि हमारे जो सभी स्टूडेंट्स हैं एलुमिनाय हैं उनको अलग-अलग विषयों पर जानकारी मिले और एक्सपर्ट्स के द्वारा मिले जो उस फील्ड में रिसर्च करते हैं जो काफी उस फील्ड में जिनका नॉलेज है तो आज मुझे बहुत खुशी है कि आज हमारे बीच में प्रोफेसर दिशा खेरे हैं जो कि शी इज अ लॉ प्रोफेसर एट महाराष्ट्र नेशनल लॉ यूनिवर्सिटी नागपुर तो वेलकम मैडम uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be part of this uh, symposium. So, I will start with Madam and then after that, Madam will start. So, uh, as I told that uh, uh, Dr. Disha Khere is, uh, is, is a law professor. She is an associate professor at Maharashtra National Law University, Nagpur. And or MNLU Nagpur, she has been doing a lot of she uh, taught at Gujarat National Law University, Gandhinagar. She almost has two decades of experience in the fields of in the field of academics and research, khas in uh, constitutional law, jurisprudence, administrative law, human rights, cyber law, and biotech laws, etc. So, Madam ka kafi uh, a varied uh, research raha hai, or Madam ka jo PhD topic tha, it was right to health uh, a human rights perspective of hiv and aids uh, patients to uh, ye madam ka uh, introduction hai aur madam ka jo topic hai wo aap sabko pata hai main ek baar dohra deta hu ki uh, is samay agar aap uh, main apna experience agar main apna batau to last ke 20 30 years mein biotech ke field mein jo developments hue hain khas taur pe health ko lekar aap sab ne cloning suna hoga ki hai na तो बहुत सारी ऐसी चीजें हो रही हैं जो आ, लीगल फील्ड में काफी कि ये एथिकल है या नहीं है या ये लीगल है या नहीं है इस पर बहुत सारे डिबेट्स हैं ठीक है बायोटेक के फील्ड में तो मतलब मैं तो आई एम नॉट अ लॉ स्टूडेंट नाइदर नॉर आई एम अ साइंस स्टूडेंट बट थोड़ा बहुत जो व्हाटएवर आई रीड लिटिल बिट सो सो देयर इज दिस ह्यूज डिबेट ऑन मेनी थिंग्स व्हिच यू नो इन बायोटेक बिकॉज़ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी इज वन फील्ड व्हिच हैज बीन एक्सपेंडिंग uh, in the last 30 40 years bahut sare naye research bahut sare naye avishkar bahut sari nayi cheeze aa rahi hain to uska jo legal perspective hai us par madam apni baat rakhenge to mujhe bahut khushi hai ki aaj aapko madam uh, is field ke bare mein aur uh, aapko ma'am ke vichar sunne ko milenge so over to you ma'am thank you so much thank you very much anup sir uh, and thank you very much uh... Nalanda Academy and uh, Digital Nalanda team for the invite. And uh, I, I, I mean, the way the development which are going on in the field of biotechnology and its relationship with that of law, the regulation part, I uh, will try my best to do the justice when it comes to how exactly this whole field is getting unfolded. So uh, 
just for the sake of uh, avoiding some kind of technical glitch because here it's raining and uh, probably there is a possibility that we may not uh, be able to actually connect properly. So I'll just be switching off my video uh, till the time. I'll be running my uh, presentation. So I hope it is fine, uh, Anup sir. And then... Uh, That's fine. Okay, okay, sir, okay. I hope the screen is uh, visible, sir. Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Yes. And I'm audible also, right? Yes, yes. Yes. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Nalanda Academy. And uh, today I am going to share a few thoughts and what I have come across when it comes to this whole convoluted relationship uh, as far as law and bi biotechnology is concerned. And I am going to deal, actually, there are many aspects to this, uh, but I am just going to actually restrict this whole discussion or sharing of information with respect to right to life and personal liberty. So uh, what I intend to actually discuss is include something on the lines as far as the whole background as to why this whole discussion is in the uh, uh, is, is there as far as international level is concerned or for that matter, one can say that globally, this has been discussed as to when it comes to the development in the field of biotechnology is concerned and the regulatory mechanism. So that I intend to discuss and then hold the whole relationship as far as law and biotechnology with a passing reference as to what all emerging trends are there uh, when we talk about biotechnology, the need as to why uh, there's a regulation, why there's this whole discussion as to regulating this whole development. And then gradually I'll be shifting the whole discussion towards this whole complex relationship of rights as well as biotechnology. And then uh, just merely three uh, sub-disciplines or probably uh, disciplines of the biotechnology that is embryonics, cloning, and cryogenics. I'll be just touching these uh, uh, disciplines of biotechnology. And then at the end, I wish to conclude it with what I believe uh, is probably uh, we need to pay attention to and uh, what exactly is the way forward when it comes to we uh, actually being exposed to something like this, where a lot of ethical, legal, moral concerns are there as far as the development in the field of biotechnology is concerned. So taking ahead our discussion, when you talk about uh, what exactly uh, when it is like biotechnology or development in the field of biotechnology is all about. I just want you to imagine a world, a world wherein you could sit in the cozy comfort of your homes and have a clone to go and work hard. And in return, you reap the benefits of this whole process, wherein you're enjoying everything at your home, whether it is entertainment, whether it is spending your time with the family, quality time with the family, or whether it is again, pursuing your hobby, et cetera, et cetera. Now the question is that, is it a distant dream? Uh, probably looking at the development which are going on in the field of biotechnology, I'll say that uh, this may not be a distant dream, but maybe a near reality for the simple reason that one can say that human cloning would be possible and in near future would be permitted also. Now this has again, I mean, when I say this, that it is possible and would be permitted in near future, I definitely have reasons to say this or I definitely have data to support this. So this takes me back to the whole, uh, again, 
development in the field of cloning is concerned. So we can refer to what happened in 1997, wherein we talk about Dolly the ship, which was considered or which is considered as first successful cloning. And after that, a series of animals like Afghan hound, or for that matter, again, uh, the, the cow uh, uh, from which was again developed or which was again cloned, whether it is again uh, Aspen, the clown who, uh, uh, the cow who was cloned in 1999, and then pig and even monkeys, or for that matter, horses are being cloned. Okay, so when you talk about all these things happening in and around you, this clearly actually gives you a picture that where exactly we are living. So I will say that currently, if I have to talk about this whole development in the field of technology, we are living in the world which is actually driven by the technology. And actually, this has assured a kind of new era, a new era of embryonics, genetics, stem cell cropping, or for that matter, right up to the human cloning. Now, when you talk about this whole development in the field of science, the science and its development actually, to be very frank, have reaped unimagined benefits on mankind, and, and especially with reference to and in context to the healthcare. But at the same time, uh, when you talk about the regulations that are now in place and the whole controversy which is going on, with respect to the development in the field of biotechnology and its probably impact, whether it is social, economic, cultural, and then the whole concerns as to ethics, legal. I think uh, it would not be wrong to say that this whole, I mean, when you talk about the ideal of scientific freedom, probably one can say that is definitely restricted and may fail to achieve its fullest potential when you talk about all the fetters with uh, the, the, the constraint that are being imposed by the society and law. Now, my whole uh, discussion is going to be on the lines wherein the balancing of these competing entities, wherein you need the development in the field of technology, as well as you need to protect the rights of the human race or for that matter when it comes to animals or the uh, again uh, experiments that are taking place as far as agriculture industry is concerned wherein again we talk about the genetically modified food so the gm technology etc cetera, etc cetera, is concerned so but how it is possible probably one of the ways is wherein we can impose some scientific responsibility and I can say this for the simple reason that we all know that when it comes to the role that is being played by the scientist and the expectations that we have, one can very well say that scientists are considered as the gatekeepers of new knowledge. And as such, probably because of that, they have this whole special responsibility towards the rest of the society, wherein they need to understand where to draw that particular boundary. Now let us try and understand the whole complexity as far as the relationship between law and biotechnology. Now what is law? Law has always been considered as a tool or for that matter, an instrument to regulate human conduct. And it's been like times and memorable laws have been developed by man for civilized society. The role that law has played as far as life of every man is concerned or human being is concerned is indispensable. Every single sphere of the human lives today actually has been regulated by plethora of laws. And again, whether, I mean, not when it comes to when we grow and we understand, but then this whole regulation begins right from the birth till the death of the human beings. So the whole discussion is going to be the regulations, the development from the life to the, or from the birth to the death. So probably it will, it would not be wrong to say that it would be from, the discussion is going to be from creation 
to the extinction, okay? So in this whole scenario, wherein we have seen the, uh, I mean, advances in the field of biotechnology, which I would be actually discussing in the uh, uh, course of our uh, lecture, it is necessary that uh, the, the arm of the law must be stretched out and it must encompass an area that immediately affects the human body so that there is no injustice that has been caused to anyone, okay? So that is where in the whole picture or whole role of the law comes into picture. So there are many controversials. I mean, these things are very, very controversial wherein the scientists are saying that their right to uh, uh, do inventions or do scientific, uh, what you can say, uh, experiments in the interest of the humans must be protected. And at the same time, there are again people who talk about human rights, protection of human rights. They also what? They also talk about what? That these developments should, in no circumstances, invasion the basic rights of what? The basic rights of the people. Okay. So basically, it is what? It is wherein we have to come up with the balance so that both the disciplines are taken care. Now talking about uh, the discipline of biotechnology and how uh, then I want to take this whole discussion ahead. So before we understand what is biotechnology, let me take your attention to these two basic questions. And that is what is life? And second question is what is death? Now, how does it work? So if I have to talk about the whole biological fluidity, it runs through, as I've said, that creating or creation and extinction, okay? Now, talking about this whole biological fluidity and relating it with the natural force or naturally, then this whole biological change is not purposive. However, when we talk about the technological intervention with respect to these two processes, it becomes purposive, wherein you say that life is being created, or for that matter, when it comes to death, probably, now there are many other ways wherein, instead of somewhere where you say that the heart has stopped beating and then you declare a particular person to be dead. Instead of that, now you have concepts such as euthanasia or for that matter, cryogenics or cryopreservation, wherein you are now freezing the body of the humans or individuals. So herein, when you talk about these aspects of life, and that too, again, as I've said, that I'll be just restricting this discussion as far as human life is concerned. This, these aspects of human life, it is what? When there is an intervention of the technology, it becomes purposive, okay? How it becomes purposive, whether it is with respect to creation or extinction, or for that matter, life or death, that is something that we will explore in long run. Now, let's try and understand what is biotechnology. So as probably you all must be aware about what is bio is life. Technology is again, application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, or probably one can definitely try and uh, come up with the explanation as to a human invented techniques to natural biological process. Again, an explanation can be found when it comes to Convention on Biological Diversity of 1993, which says that it is what? Technological application that uses biological systems living organisms or derivatives thereof to make or modify products or processes for specific use. So in short, if I have to talk about biotechnological inventions, then it is, or it can be divided into two things. One is product, which is consisting of biological material. An example for this can be a vaccine, and then a process by which biological material is produced, pro processed, or for that matter, used. And, and one of the example for this process can be an 
IVF technology, right? So let us now try to understand, take our journey further as to what exactly the whole scenario is when it comes to the development in the field of biotechnology and how it is impacting human lives. So there are a few areas which actually have uh, important ethical, social, uh, moral and legal issues which are closely related with each other. And they are again, they have come into the global scenario because there was development in the field of biotechnology. So if I have to talk about the emerging trends in the biotechnology, which again has some or the other relationship as far as regulation is concerned or for that matter, guidelines or laws to again, control or balance the conflicting interests, then we have many to name, but let us just uh, look at few of them. So it is again, abortion related issues. Then you have ARTs, which is again, artificial reproductive techniques, embryonics. Then you have again, euthanasia. You have again, surrogacy, organ donation, organ transplantation, bioharvesting, xenotransplantation, genomics or eugenics, cloning, cryonics, biomapping, transsexuality, biomapping again, and biopiracy. Uh, all, all these, again, are branches which are evolving and they have all the impacts as far as life or death aspects of humans. And thereby then it further makes us or takes us or rather should uh, give this hold. Uh, I mean, make you actually get into the details as to why there is a need to then, if this is something which is in the interest of the human beings or human race, then why there is a need that we should have laws or regulations for this. So if I have to talk about this whole balancing that is required, I need to bring this to your kind attention that if I have to talk about the era in which we are now leaving, this is the era wherein we find widening disparities as far as health and human rights are concerned. At one point of time, we are finding spectacular advances in biotechnology, which I have already uh, shown you, discussed with you in the previous slide. So there is this era wherein widening disparities are there and there are spectacular advances in the biotechnology. With these things, in existence, it is now necessary for us to reflect as to when it comes to the, again, reaping the benefits of these advances in the field of biotechnology and with respect to the, again, extent of human rights concentrations are there, whether these benefits are only for the most privileged people or whether this should be available to the world at large or should be available to one and all. Now, the, here again, it again takes us to, again, discussing why there is a need. So as I've told you that the advances in the field of biotechnology actually have resulted into new forms of powers which are being enlisted and which are unfortunately till date can be said unchecked. So this whole scenario is what required that this must be, this whole advancement in the field of biotechnology must be harnessed with the use of great wisdom. Further taking ahead our discussion as to then how and where uh, do we come across and what exactly we are concerned. So as I've said that we are, are we actually concerned with the rights of the privileged people who have so much to look forward from the scientific progress or whether we are concerned with the rights of miserable people who live under miserable considerations. So when it comes to, again, trying to balance this whole conflicting interest as to advancement and the benefits to be uh, made available, accessible, affordable, 
I guess we have a lot of things to what, a lot of things to take into consideration, whether it is disparities, which are constantly widening, whether it is abuse of power and how this power is being used, okay? And I guess one can definitely relate this whole scenario with whatever has happened in past two to three years when it comes to COVID or pandemic, where in again, the, the, the uh, whole disparities were really very visible as to access of these, what, advancement in the field of technology. Where does this whole thing comes into picture? So basically, as I've told you, that I'll be just restricting it to life and death. So the whole complex relationship begins with this whole individual's fundamental right. And this individual's fundamental right is with respect to procreative liberty. So you have what? You have right to reproduce and you have again, otherwise can be said as right not to reproduce. This is something wherein which plays an important role as far as continuation of human race, okay? So when it comes to this fundamental right of individual, which is procreative liberty, let us try and understand how the development in the field of biotechnology has intervened and has resulted into, again, a lot of scope being there, whether it is technical side of it or whether it is a regulation side of it, okay? So you have right to reproduce and then you have right not to reproduce or right to abortion for that matter. Now talking about right to reproduce is again, natural biological means is by coital means. And then you have again, one more method and that is non-coital means. And one of the examples can be IVF, okay? So there is again, this whole non-coital means includes genetic screening, selective abortions, as well as, again, right to select your mate or source for donated eggs, sperms, or embryos. So this is how, when you talk about what creation of life is concerned and the intervention of biotechnology, okay? So now we are going to uh, enter into a very, very important field of what biotechnology, which is again, embryonics, which talks about how and what way the life is created. So as I've mentioned, embryonics and that too again, IVF technology. So what is IVF? It is in voto fertilization, which is a process of fertilization where an egg is combined with sperms outside the body. Okay, so something wherein an embryo is being formed outside the body, as in outside the womb of the mother. So an embryo is being created in the laboratory. So a life is being created in the laboratory. Okay, so embryonics is basically something which is relating to or being an embryo. What is an embryo? Embryo is again an unborn or unhashed offspring in the process of development. In particular, a human offspring during the period from approximately the second to eighth week after fertilization, after which it is usually termed as fetus, wherein we say that, okay, now there is what? There's a life into it, okay? So this is wherein, when it comes to this particular technique, a process wherein we talk about life being created, okay? There's a reproduction of life. So this is the technology that we use, okay? Now the questions that revolve around this particular technology, I'll be jumping uh, immediately as far as rules, regulations are concerned that under such circumstances where we are talking about embryos where we are talking about laboratories, IVF laboratories, IVF technologies, stem cell laboratories, et cetera, et cetera. And then using this whole technology for reproducing humans, there are certain questions which are pertinent and which requires an immediate attention to be addressed is when it comes to state, can the state control human embryo adoption by enacting laws to govern it? 
At the same time, whether there can be a limit as to the number of ways a person can reproduce. Again, you talk about coital means, you talk about non-coital means. At the same time, again, when you talk about exercising this right to reproduction, whether this right to reproduction is a fundamental right, or rather we already understand it or have agreed that it is rather a fundamental right. And when we are saying that it is a fundamental right, what is its status when it comes to the whole concept of surrogacy? Whether when you talk about this process being used, IVF mechanism being used, whether it is also a part and parcel of the right to privacy. So these are few uh, uh, questions which actually are required and immediate attention when you talk about advancement in the field of technology affecting or rather impacting as far as creation of life is concerned. And then the whole who has got the right to have access to this benefit of the technology. Further, uh, there are again many uh, questions which revolves around this whole creation of life or the process of creation of life is who would get the custody of cryopreserved embryos in case there is a death of a spouse or both the spouse are no more. Or for that matter, there is a divorce. Or for that matter, one of the spouse no longer wanting to have a child. Under such circumstances, again, these questions play important role and makes us think as to what should be the responsibility of the clinic to continue when it comes to storage as to these circumstances or situation coming across as to death or divorce or one of the spouse no longer wanting to have child. And again, to how long the clinic is under the obligation to continue storing these embryos. Whether again, abandoned embryos, they can be used by the clinics for research, uh, whether they can be used to donate to other couples or individual uh, women. What is the status when there is non-payment of storage of fees or any other unforeseen circumstances for that matter? And at the same time, one more question that is required to be looked into is the posthumous creation of a child through surrogacy. Now, all these questions are revolving around and these are the questions which are continuously being uh, deliberated and we still do not have an exact answer to it or rather we are still uh, in the process of deliberating and coming up with some or the other kind of regulation whether it is uh, the, the partners, family or clinics etc cetera, etc cetera, and the state, the state as a stakeholder. Well, there are two important decisions. However, I'll say that these cannot be considered as the conclusive uh, decisions. But yes, uh, there are two decisions by the U.S. court which have given random ruling and uh, which, which actually have tried to address these issues and tackle these issues. And this is taken actually to uh, uh, the, the whole again, discussion as to whether the embryo has a life and whether the status of the embryo is that of a person or whether the status of the embryo is that of property. So looking at this, uh, uh, this particular case in Vo versus France, the whole issue of consideration before the court of law was when the right to life begins, when it comes to what? When it comes to embryo. Okay, so that was the question which was required to be decided by the court. Uh, further, they again had to look into the nature and the legal status of embryo or for that matter, the fetus. And at this end, they actually came up with this finding that the unborn are not covered by the right to life under Article 2. Again, the whole discussion resulted into as far as the facts and circumstances of the uh, case are concerned, I can say that they did not result into something very conclusive, but at least one can say 
that these decisions actually then resulted into what at least deliberation as to the status of the embryo is concerned, whether it is a person and when the life begins. Similarly, talking about the second decision is Davis versus Davis, which is uh, in the year 1992. Here, the Supreme Court of Tennessee actually ended up deciding a dispute over the cryopreserved pre-embryos. Okay, so here the wife actually had an objection uh, when it comes to destroying the embryos because then they parted their ways, they got divorced, and now. They had their own opinion as to what shall be done, whether they should be given to adoption to some other couple, et cetera, et cetera. However, the courts actually, uh, the court uh, actually what uh, uh, decided and this particular, again, the decision in this particular uh, case is not to be considered as binding. However, it resulted into suggesting a framework for resolving similar dispute in the United States and in many other countries, this is something which is being followed, right? Now, taking ahead our discussion as to what is the status with respect to this whole scenario. So as far as India is concerned, as to embryonics or IVF clinics are concerned, so we have these Medical Council Professional Conduct Etiquettes and Ethics Regulation of 2002, which actually have enumerated various responsibilities, duties, powers, and rights of medical practitioners and hold them accountable for their actions. Uh, the code under the regulation also applies to medical practitioners at IVF cleaning. Then we have again, certain uh, guidelines which are given by uh, the uh, uh, ICMR. They are not binding, but definitely they look into the accreditation, supervision and regulation of ART techniques. Then we have the Assisted Reproductive Technology Act of 2021. Then uh, we definitely have the rules of 2022, which also has tried to what address this whole issue. Uh, can't say that they are comprehensive enough, but definitely must appreciate that an attempt is being made in this direction in India. Taking ahead as to uh, the, the current scenario as far as Surrogacy Regulation Act is concerned, which was passed in 2021, it talks about the eligibility criteria, it covers uh, matters relating to health implication, the rights of surrogate mother and the child born, the financial burden and compensation, et cetera, et cetera. It is the act which has made the commercial surrogacy illegal because again, those who interest, those interested, they can definitely look into the whole controversy as far as uh, village Anand is concerned in Gujarat, uh, wherein uh, it is considered as a capital of surrogacy, commercial surrogacy. So those interested, they can definitely look into and then probably uh, understand why uh, the, the whole decision has been taken towards making commercial surrogacy an illegal act. Uh, it definitely allows the altruistic surrogacy for needy, infertile Indian couples. It, uh, of course, uh, the whole procedure is to be followed. Certificate of doctors is required with respect to infertility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Restrictions wherein women can be surrogate only once. But at the same time, there's one point of consideration which the, the legislatures are required to look into. And that is this particular legislation, piece of legislation uh, bans the single parents or homosexuals or living couples from going ahead with uh, the, the, the whole surrogacy and, and having a family as such. So that is again something which, is, uh, which requires a lot of research and a lot of deliberations on this. Now, this is something when we talk about creation of life, wherein we are creating uh, or, or creating a life as far as embryo is concerned. There's one more method by which uh, reproduction is possible, and that is cloning. So cloning is also being viewed as another form of asexual uh, reproduction. And as I've mentioned, 
in the initial uh, slides that scientists are actually very close to being able to clone human beings. So the day is not very far wherein you probably will find uh, uh, someone cloned like you sitting next to you. What are the legal or the moral or the ethical issues revolving around this whole uh, issue of or, or the development in the field of biotechnology that is cloning. So here again, we need to balance the conflicting interests. So the question pertinent to be uh, addressed is, would laws or bans for that matter and regulation restrict the scientists' right to pursue their intellectual interests, which is also an integral part of an individual fundamental right because there are many regulations at international level which has uh, to great extent banned cloning is again the question that is required to be addressed is is human cloning a reproduction in the strict sense of the term or is merely a replication again as i mentioned that there are many international attempts so in spite of again the international attempts resulting in uh, uh, a non-binding uh, declaration to control human cloning, therapeutic cloning has not been completely banned in many countries. Now let us try to actually understand the whole controversy about this whole creation of a human clone or rather again a method as far as creation of life is concerned. So the concerns or the controversy about human clone is this that the possibility of replicating a human being, whether deceased or living, okay? Through again, the SCNT, that is somatic cell nuclear transfer, the technique that was used to create Dolly the ship. So if we are able to replicate the human being living and deceased or deceased, it definitely is going to what result into a lot of things and i think one uh, uh, this this picture speaks louder than what probably i intend to share with you so probably you may be surprised to see someone like you and then you will be like oh the technology has uh, cloned you so you have someone exactly similar to you and, and there probably may not be any end when it comes to wishful thinking of humans, wherein probably someone might want to clone, wherein uh, might approach the cloning lab and say that that person wants a girl just like the girl that married his dear old dad. So that there probably may not be any end to this kind of wishful thinking. Now here, when you talk about all these things, let us try to understand why this is, uh, the, the, the matter is that of controversy. So I'll just quickly look into, uh, take you into the two things and I will not take you into the details as far as science and all that is concerned, just for your reference and for your understanding, uh, I'll just make you understand the difference between therapeutic cloning and reproductive cloning because again as i've said that at international level there is what few countries that they have allowed therapeutic cloning and the whole reproductive cloning is being banned what is the difference when you talk about therapeutic cloning it is used for or use in treating medical disorders. When it comes to reproductive cloning, it is used for the purpose of creative cloned human beings. Now, here again, when you talk about the problems with therapeutic cloning, it is where people, they again believe that it is involving wherein you create embryos and then you destroy them for stem cells. And there then comes the whole issue as to how far it is morally correct. And rather many believe that it is morally wrong to do something like this because they believe that even embryo has a life. And I'm sure again, the image that is there on the uh, screen speaks loud when it comes to what? When it comes to the whole problem and the controversy and the whole dilemma as far as therapeutic cloning is concerned. 
taking ahead our discussion as far as the whole controversy is concerned. They, the, the, the proponent actually, they argue that this may provide key as far as eliminating certain diseases. But then many believe that this results, as I've already mentioned, in creation and destruction of hundreds of embryos. And then when you talk about this whole technology, the cloning technology, we again come back to the question as to what is life. So this whole cloning technology have the potential to change the definition of life. And thereby, once there is a change in the definition of life, we definitely need to look into the rules, laws, regulations, which probably will come with it. Uh, 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 whenever we enter into this whole field of reproductive cloning. Now, talking about the problems with reproductive cloning, as I've told you that it is for reproducing humans, okay? So is deemed again morally wrong because it is creating a human life. Maybe the purpose can be just to be a walking organ donor for the person after whom they are created again. I think I need not get into the details of this. This whole picture on the slide again speaks louder than what uh, we talk about the whole discussion as to where life begins and right to life is concerned. And I think probably uh, we are about to witness the whole era of clone rights soon, wherein uh, 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 the clone is asking who I am and you're saying that you are my clone and I made you and your exact copy of me, which will come in handy. That means if I need heart transplantation, I'll just simply take yours or I need any other organization, uh, organs for that matter, I'll take those organs from you. The whole question is, and the controversy is that again, wherein we may have to address this, that as to what would be then the rights of the clone, which is born out of you, and what if he says, or that clone says, no. Are we ready to address these issues? Are we ready to take care of all these things? There are actually important justifications also which are given when it comes to human cloning technology. It helps the infertile couples. It helps in recreating the lost child or relative. It helps you to exercise your pre, uh, procreative liberty. Again, it helps you to have offspring, which is free of genetic defects. So if there is uh, there are any uh, anomalies or any genetic defect, or DNA uh, is uh, something which can be now with CRISPR and other technology, you can actually end up editing the DNA also. So probably that will help you to have an offspring free of genetic defects. It will help you with uh, medical cures. It will help you, or rather it is considered as a step towards immortality. Further talking about, again, uh, at one point of advantages, but then there are critical controversies also, which says that it probably will uh, demolish the familial relationship, wherein you probably will not be in a position to understand what exactly relationship do I share with my clone, whether that clone is my child, whether that clone is my sister, whether that clone has any other name. Then again, the whole issue is whether that clone a child is a commodity or a merchandise. It probably may result into a lot of medical dangers, a lot of societal dangers, uh, the, the psychological, the emotional uh, uh, issues uh, that the clone child probably may go through when it comes to uh, others knowing this, that this particular child is a clone child. So probably that may impact the whole 
issue or the, the whole thing as far as dignity of that clone child is concerned. So these are again, what these are again, like advantages, disadvantages, the uh, explanations which are, or justifications as well as the controversies with respect to human cloning. But then, as I've said previously, that yes, the, the science is, we are near, wherein one can say that we are progressing towards creating human clones. Let's quickly look into the whole regulatory mechanism, whether there are any uh, rules, laws, et cetera, et cetera. So more than 50 countries have formally banned human clonings. In 1998, the Council of Europe, they have issued an amendment to its Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine. There was an additional protocol uh, which was issued to the Convention on Prohibition of Cloning Human Beings, which actually prohibits any intervention seeking to create a human being genetically identical to another human being, whether living or dead. Further, in 2005, uh, United Nations adopted its declaration on human cloning to try to deal with this issue. But this declaration, again, with respect to this human cloning is ambiguously drafted or ambiguously worded, wherein it prohibits all forms of human cloning in as much as they are incompatible with human dignity and protection of human life. So again, when it comes to research, as far as this area is concerned, rules regulation is concerned, there's a lot of scope when it comes to the appropriate drafting of these, uh, uh, what you can say, regulations, rules, uh, are concerned with respect to, again, advancement in the field of biotechnology. Uh, I'm sure again, uh, this particular image speaks louder wherein scientists, they are actually very, very uh, happy and uh, excited with the whole uh, way this whole field of cloning is or the development in the field of uh, science and technology is happening. And they are of the opinion that they believe that they can stop uh, anytime they want. However, uh, when it comes to, again, what? When it comes to people who are into inquiry relating to ethics and other things or morality or law regulations, they believe that this particular way or uh, the, the way that we are going ahead is actually a slippery slope. And probably once we march towards it, uh, probably it will be difficult to then control it. So why not have rules and regulations at place in advance? Quickly uh, going to the next question, and uh, probably this is the last part of what I intend to share with you all. And that is something to deal with what is death and how there is an intervention of biotechnology as far as this question of what is death. Uh, I guess I'll say this, that for many people, the whole idea of living in future uh, means much more than merely extended lifespan. Uh, the desire to live as long as possible need not be viewed as an inhuman desire. People are there who actually want to what? live for long. Okay, so this is again when you talk about what, when you talk about this particular discipline of biotechnology, wherein we say cryonics or cryopreservation, here the human bodies or the, the, the uh, life is been what? It, they are being frozen and kept in the tube in the laboratories, and this is actually already happening okay so imagine a world where people could get themselves frozen to wake up at a later stage or at a later time and most of us are concerned with aging and would definitely want to postpone death so these are again things wherein uh, when it comes to scientists or cryonicists they actually do not believe that cryopreservation is suicide the other uh, issues that kept on uh, 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 making their presence 
when it comes to deliberations relating to cry preservation or cryonics is where does the whole soul go when the person is frozen? Those who are interested, they can definitely look into this case of Thomas uh, Donaldson of California, but they have tried to discuss about this whole issue of cryopreservation and uh, uh, cryonics. The other issues that uh, are uh, uh, that that probably we would be uh, required to uh, address as to uh, when it comes to what when it comes to the 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 uh, the what exactly is the status. I mean whether the person who has already been declared dead and rather whether that particular person who's been frozen whether can be declared as legally dead, how would and how could the law then reinstate them? Could that person reclaim assets that they owned in their life but has now passed to family members on death? Could the whole inheritance law be undone or whether we need to again revisit and redo and uh, restructure our laws relating to inheritance? And, and if the spouse of the person who has been frozen is still alive, but then has now remarried, will that marriage still be valid when the former partner returns from the dead? And, and when it comes to all these questions, even before this uh, happens, what is the whole status of the corpus during its time in the deep freeze? Does it have any legal rights? How long should a frozen corpus be stored? And would the individual's family have the right to thaw or rather destroy the corpus without reanimating it? Whether again, not only these, there are other things which are related to law, which includes law of torts, law of contracts, et cetera, et cetera. So the suits definitely can be there, whether when it comes to any kind of damage that has been suffered by the freezy. So how are we going to address those suits as far as law of contracts and law of torts is concerned? Uh, again, the question as to assuming a freezy can suffer damages, whether malpractice suits against physicians or technicians who uh, have uh, frozen or uh, maintain or thought the patient will be successful then the whole effectiveness of disclaimer clauses in legal agreements will have to be tested in the change scenario or change circumstances. Again, the whole question as to product liability as to whether there can be an action against manufacturers, freezing and distributors of the apparatus uh, will be successful. That is also a question which is required to be looked into. Now, this is wherein I wish to end uh, uh, my discussion as far as the advancement in the field of technology is concerned. So if I have to talk about how to deal and how to move ahead, we have already known and, and, and we have seen that there are what different fields of biotechnology research and the development, they actually have inspired uh, different reactions and decisions in, in last couple of decades. So talking about how to deal this whole uh, development. So again, a lot of things which comes into picture whenever we talk about the regulations as far as uh, advancement in the field of technology is concerned and its impact on human life is concerned. So each country actually has to go for a social mobilization. There should be a political legalization. And, and, and again, uh, the social economic structure, the, the impact of it, because when it comes to, again, advancement in the field of, uh, uh, say, uh, agriculture is concerned, the whole uh, issue of the scarcity of food is being taken care as far as GM food technology is concerned. So these things are actually uh, uh, necessary and they have proved to be in the interest, at least addressing the challenges that human race was facing at appropriate times. But then 
there's a requirement that now uh, these fields are required to be developed in the line or in the light of social sciences. We need that there should be a defined uh, uh, regulatory mechanism which will be acting as an instrument of social change and it will be in a position to what? It will be in a position to then address the whole uh, conflicting interest that we have seen as far as the scientific uh, investigative rights are concerned and the justice with respect to, again, uh, uh, relating to accessibility, affordability, and availability of these uh, development in the field of uh, technology. So here I end uh, my, my discussion and I hope I have given you some points uh, to think. So keep thinking and thank you very much. And I hope I made some sense. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. Uh, thank you for this fantastic presentation. Uh, for, for my students, I'm sure that because, because you have you have covered all the basics of the biotech and law, so I'm I'm 100 percent sure that they will find it much, much enriching. So uh, we have a couple of questions uh, that uh, that were that came uh, on message. So anyone uh, any of our students or any other participant has any question to ask to Professor Disha, uh, you can put on chat, uh, on Zoom chat. And also if you are on YouTube, you can put it on YouTube uh, board and I will take it from there and ask them, ask them. So any of our students and participants wants to have, uh, you know, to ask any question, Please go ahead. We have uh, 10, 15 minutes, 10 minutes at most, and we can. So there is one question that has come to me is about this uh, surrogacy debate in India, because uh, uh, you know, as you have already, you have also mentioned in your uh, presentation that Gujarat used to be the hub of uh, surrogate mothers. And 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 it it was seen as a kind of an employment, uh, as a kind of an uh, uh, employment opportunity, not employment per se, but uh, an opportunity for poor women to earn money. Right. And 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 a lot of you know we have heard that there are a lot of film stars and 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 uh, you know rich people opting for surrogacy. And without any reason, I mean, uh, they, they were fertile, you know, uh, and couple, you know, despite that, just because they have money. And then there were this lot of uh, medical tourism kind of thing was happening that uh, many foreigners used to visit, right? And now government has been little strict. So what is your take? Because uh, uh, the question is that, uh, as you mentioned that, uh, you know, the, these biomedical advances help the privileged the most, right? And, and the life of privileged becomes better. So what is the role of law to, 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 to make sure that the rich should not be able to, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, benefit in the wrong way? And it's the, 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 all the researches on whatever development that has taken place in my biomedical field should be uh, should get to those who are actually in need rather than just because they have resources. Um, uh, talking about uh, what uh, is still happening in India with respect to surrogacy and Anand uh, to be considered as a capital, still considered as yeah. a capital of surrogacy. Definitely, it was considered as a source of income for poor people because, again, a uh, lot of issues relating to employment and other things. But this actually has been misused and became a matter of convenience for those who could afford, actually. Now, here comes, as I've already mentioned, that when it comes to accessibility, affordability, and availability of the advancement in the technology is concerned, here comes the role of law regulations and, again, uh, 
the mechanism that probably tries to balance this. And thereby then we say that to some extent, the Surrogacy Act uh, of 2021 has tried to address it. Because when you look at this, uh, the, the surrogacy being the source of income, they actually uh, did not take into consideration the repercussions that they had on the health of the woman who was being uh, undergoing this whole process of surrogacy continuously. So it had definitely impacted the health of the woman. So what has been stated in the act is that when it comes to commercial surrogacy, there is a ban. So they wanted to address this whole issue of health. Right. But again, whether it, it, it clearly addresses as to those who want to actually go ahead with it and then uh, consider it as a source of income, uh, still there is no clear answer to it. It has blanketly uh, banned commercial surrogacy, yeah. which negatively impacts a part of or a section of uh, society. Okay, so that is one way. However, when it comes to accessibility and then availability and using it for or rather misuse of this. So this has been taken care of by the law, by the act stating this, that under what circumstances you can go for surrogacy. So there is a requirement of the certificate or there is an eligibility criteria which has been mentioned, the certificate of infertility, et cetera, et cetera. So these things are being addressed uh, as far as the current legal framework is concerned. But again, as I mentioned that it's not the comprehensive one, we definitely need to relook into it and uh, uh, find answers for probably, again, the issues which are still there relating to surrogacy. I hope that... Uh, yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, next question is by Nilesh. Uh, how fast Indian laws are adapting to these biotechnological advancements as compared to the rest of the world? Oh, I'm not very happy to answer this, but then unfortunately we are we are far far behind. We are very slow. Uh, first and the foremost is we still have not understood actually how it is impacting even the basic rights of uh, us. And uh, so it's just it's just the beginning. We still uh, I mean there's long way to go when it comes to, again, having a foolproof uh, regulatory mechanism. But then, yes, it is in the process. It is in the process. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, then Siddharth uh, has three questions. Uh, what about clones for war? And what about 3D organ culture? And what about societal morals and, and advancement in embryonic in relation to gender? So the questions is, is in the chat box. So you can also see. Uh, yeah. The three so, uh, yeah. Uh, so that uh, wonderful questions. But then again, uh, I am unable to answer it. Uh, considering uh, uh, there is no clear uh, evidence as to we uh, uh, have successfully created human clones. But right. then, yes, there are a couple of, uh, uh, again, news or articles which are being written about specific country uh, trying to be or in the process of having their army or cloned uh, army for, again, using it for the purpose of wars and all that. I think uh, instead of just uh, restricting this to clone for wars, I think the area of research where we can look into is the nature of war which is changing so initially the war was more between the the uh, and the, uh, uh, the things or the techniques which were used were mostly the weapons were like what you had swords, you had then arms and ammunition, but now the nature has changed. And now we have something to deal with bio warms, uh, wars mm -hmm. or chemical wars, 
or information technology being uh, included into it. And then we have something on the lines of cyber warfare also. So I think uh, cloned for wars probably can be said is very, very uh, restrictive, uh, uh, not that we cannot look into it when it comes to research, but then I think you should go for broader aspect of it, wherein uh, bio wars can be addressed, awesome. rules and regulations required for that. So that is uh, 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 the uh, thing as far as wars are concerned. Awesome. And, uh, when it comes to 3D organ culture, probably we are still in the process of understanding, as I have already mentioned, that we are still in the process of understanding it. Okay, so again, a lot of research is required when it comes to what are the implications that it is going to have on human life, and then accordingly balancing as to how beneficial it is going to be and how uh, again, uh, what you can say harmful it is going to be. Uh, talking about the social uh, or societal morals and advancement in the embryonics in relation to gender. Uh, I think so that uh, probably you would be interested in knowing uh, something on the lines as far as designer babies that is something discussed where in with the help of uh, the genetic engineering or gene editing mechanism, then you are able to actually edit the DNA and you can have the traits that you want to have in that particular baby. So that is again one area. And again, this actually poses a lot of uh, challenges as to whether this should be allowed or not. So bioethics, morality is again, something wherein a lot of research is going on in Western countries. Unfortunately, we are still in the process in India. However, India is also slowly and gradually uh, 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 moving towards having it. But then yes, uh, we are going to face a lot of issues uh, with respect to, for the simple reason still, we have, again, a preference that has been given to a male child as compared to female child, looking at the social uh, setup. So definitely there are a lot of uh, issues that uh, India is going to uh, be addressing and will have to answer through rules, regulations. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh... Then next question is from Jayesh. Uh, recently, there was this debate on right to abortion, you know, uh, where Supreme Court, uh, I think there was some judgment of Supreme Court regarding the time period uh, for, for married women and for unmarried women, I guess. I think Jayesh is asking that in that context. So what is the stand of court on the right of abortion of unmarried women while it is given to married women? Uh uh, again, this takes me back to uh, the discussion as to the procreative liberty. Okay, so that's a fundamental right of an individual. Herein, to what extent there should be an interference, and that to again interference deciding as to the status of a woman, whether she is married or whether that woman is unmarried, okay? So when it comes to the decision of a woman, and if it is with respect to the health of the woman, probably that time intervention by the court can be understood. But just because a particular woman is an unmarried woman, whether she should have right to decide to continue with the uh, uh, pregnancy or whether to abort the pregnancy, that should be uh, limited and that should be with that particular woman irrespective of married and unmarried. Again, here when you talk about the whole unmarried woman category, if you are again trying to relate it to someone who's a victim of rape, and out of that act, if the, the, I mean, the woman has conceived, then again, 
the whole picture is different okay so when it comes to law which clearly indicates that till when you can terminate the pregnancy and again the grounds are being categorically mentioned under what circumstances you can terminate the pregnancy that is i guess a uh, uh, kind of at place as far as indian scenario is concerned but again i'll get back to the two words that are been used as to unmarried woman and married woman and right to abortion or right of abortion interference just because unmarried and married and then relating it with this whole right to autonomy as far as my body is concerned and deciding i think that should not make a difference and there should not be any intervention or interference by any third uh, 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 probably authority or a body i hope you, that uh, answers yeah so there is this huge debate in us also no this uh, right to abortion is a much bigger debate in us than in india unfortunate i mean <laughs> if you see we we consider west to be very liberal and very progressive but the kind of debates they are having on right to abortion i feel that india is little bit more progressive in that sense yeah. maybe we are not having debate maybe that is what <laughs> india <laughs> appears to be more progressive i guess Uh, I, i will i will agree to what you have said uh, that yes to some extent we have opened our uh, uh, thoughts right. with respect to uh, allowing the individual to decide right. but when it comes to western societies the whole problem is uh, that they mix up many things they mix up uh, the religion they mixed right, up right. the other practices etc etc so that is why these issues are getting more and more complex and they're struggling to have uh, uh, answers for it so same thing is- i have seen with the debates on vaccine <laughs> in india we don't i mean everybody ex- accepted that we need vaccine and everybody agreed but there is this whole debate in the west especially in us or yeah. whether vaccine is a hoax or not it's a fake thing right. yeah, it's interesting uh, this is last question ma'am on Please. mercy killing euthanasia you have mentioned mm-hmm. that in india you know there are uh, there are many western countries where mercy killing is allowed or, uh, under cer- certain circumstances but in india uh, the government has been very strict so why do you think that this difference between a western society accepting the mercy killing whereas in the uh, government or indian society is not so uh, open about it because ultimately it de- uh, it deals about the dignity of life right one person who is suffering and uh, and so uh, so so uh, you know in support of mercy killing this whole debate of dignity of dignity of a individual always comes up that dignity is very important for a person so if he is ill with some disease which is not curable and suffering so he should he or she should be allowed to die uh, the right to die so but in india uh, there is not much debate on it and india has been very strict on this i mean it has not allowed uh, it so what is your take on this man uh sir i think when it comes to euthanasia uh, with the aruna shanbak uh, decision right. and then we have uh, recently had in 2017 the mental health care act which actually has tried to address this whole issue of uh, active and passive euthanasia with having a provision at place uh, which is about advance uh, directives okay so where in a person has been given a right to decide as to if he or she is suffering which is like it's a he is or he or she is terminally ill then uh, there are clauses wherein you can decide as to what is to be done with you you can actually appoint someone as a legal guardian uh, to decide as to take call whether you should be put on the external support uh, to to extend your life or whether uh, uh, that external support which we call it as pulling the plug wherein then uh, the external support is been removed so i guess though the uh, progress in this area and there is still no clarity 
because we still uh, 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 debate on this whole active and passive euthanasia. So uh, here again, with these provisions in Mental Health Care Act of 2017, advanced directives and other things and the guidelines relating to it, I think we are moving towards uh, 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 what I can say, uh, recognizing the right to die with dignity. So that is slow, but steady progress towards it, wherein again, an intervention of the technology would be allowed when it comes to creation and extinction. So euthanasia is extinction wherein death or to die with dignity is in the process. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so uh, are there any other questions from the students? Uh, there is, uh, no, I don't think right now. Let me check on the YouTube. So. Uh, we just have one more minute to go. So if uh, one or two minutes left, so anyone else wants to ask a question, otherwise uh, we can, we can, you know, uh, end the session. So, so I think that's it, ma'am. And uh, there's no more questions. So thank you so much on behalf of Nalanda staff and students. I would like to thank you for, you know, uh, coming and delivering a wonderful lecture. And we are looking forward for more such lectures from you in coming months. Uh, so we have a, a, around like 20, 25 students who are pursuing law. So, and we are very committed and focused that our community needs good lawyers. And, and lawyers who can who can work in all fields, not only in, uh, uh, I mean, not only related to atrocities. I want my lawyer, our lawyer community, to be to be you know uh, uh, fighting cases on different issues. So I'm looking forward, and I hope that uh, we will get your mentorship uh, for our law students, and 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 our, our our students can 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 really you know, excel in their academics and, and in their work. So thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Anup, yeah. sir. And thank you, uh, Team Nalanda, for having me here today. And uh, as you have said, that uh, there are many, again, opportunities for a law student, whether it is litigation, whether it is uh, judiciary, corporate sector. Now they can enter into policy making. So there are think tanks. And all these, again, when you say, uh, branches uh, of uh, development, whether it is biotechnology or information communication technology, anyone needs any help, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll be more than happy uh, with whatever possible uh, resources that I have uh, to help you. And uh, I will be happy to be part of their journey. So thank you very much, everyone, once again. Thank you. Thank you, and Jamie, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Jabim, everyone.